I've been climbing at uh, Vertical Adventures for probably seven years now, maybe eight. In a place like Winnipeg, it's absolutely necessary. I mean, we have like the shortest climbing season. When I started climbing at Vertical Adventures, Justin Jones was the owner and manager and was kind of running the operations. But before Justin, I'm not super familiar. You know, I really don't know much about the original owners. Uh, I think their names are Jake and Cindy, but that's about all I know. Often the history of climbing in Winnipeg is not really talked about because it, it's, even when I was starting, climbing was barely a sport here uh, and wasn't really recognized as much more than a pastime. So I think it's really important to know how these places like Vertical Adventure started and what, what that gives to us now. I think it's important to know the history of an area and who developed it. To have an appreciation for the space and the care they put into it and how they kind of have set the standard for how an area should be prepared for. I would say I'm like somewhat aware on the history, but if you uh, made me take a test, I would probably fail. How does an alpine club start in a flat place like Manitoba, right? Uh, that's, that's often the question, that's what gets me big eyes of wonder <laughs> when I say, yeah, the alpine club originated in Manitoba. My daughter and I drove one time up to Gunton to see the little rocks at Gunton and we could see the curvature of the earth, we, we knew that it was flat. <laughs> Living in the flatlands as we are, it is a little bit of an unusual activity to have people who are interested in vertical experiences. Way back in the 1890s, well-to-do Winnipeggers seemed to like going to the mountains to relax and to hike and climb. And there was one in particular, Elizabeth Parker, who was a reporter for the Winnipeg Free Press. She was a dynamic individual who was very loyal to the Canadian cause and certainly a person of, of great influence. She uh, became aware that some of the other Canadian mountain enthusiasts were wanting to join the American Alpine Club. And she raised the issue of excuse me, we're not American, we're Canadian, why can't we have our own Alpine Club? She convinced them that this was just not adequate to join the American Alpine Club and not have our own. And so in or around 1905, uh, they started coming together and meeting and realizing that they could form their own Alpine Club of Canada. Today it seems like young folks are obsessed with climbing, right? And if you look back in the old stories that were published in the Canadian Alpine Journal, you'll find similar sentiments. Uh, and if you want to look back a hundred years ago, I don't know if, if those people would call it being obsessed with climbing, but they sure enjoyed themselves. experience in climbing locally was with friends out in Gunton Quarries, which actually, as it turns out, was also the place where, in the 1920s, the climbers of the day here also practiced out there. So friends of ours would go down to the quarries and scale limestone there. And it was a lot of fun. And that was kind of what hooked me into rock climbing. I think with Peter Aitchison, Everett Fee, and uh, Richard Tilley, and a number of that generation, they discovered the Gooseneck Cliffs, which is a stunning uh, granite monolith out 
in uh, north of Kenora. You and Bob Spencer who were really Australians at that time and were visiting here and they found they started looking around for cliffs and they went to Minaki police station and the police told them about the big cliffs which we now call gooseneck cliffs on the road from Minaki to what was in those days called the White Dog Indian Reserve. But they went and had a look there and they climbed the first routes on Gooseneck. As far as we could tell, nobody had ever climbed there before, but we never saw any sign of a climbing activity. And, and you would do in those days because pitons left scars and marks in the rock. So I'm um, pretty sure nobody had ever climbed there before. And of course, any climber who is interested in rock climbing, the, the very most prestigious thing you can do is do a first ascent on a rock climb that has never been done before. Uh, and lo and behold, of course, here was this amazing cliff that uh, just captivated Peter and, and, and the rest of them, and including myself. Uh, to do first ascents is something that uh, is uh, so exciting because you have to maybe do it many times before you can actually succeed to get to the top. But it's a very gymnastic, problem solving, and totally in intense experience. Uh, and I think that's, that was a turning point for the whole region here of climbers. My father and, you know, a lot of his friends back in the 70s when I was quite young, but you know, even in the early 80s, did a lot of development of those areas. I was, um, you know, I was aware that there was this sort of very core group of rock climbers in, in you know, mostly in Winnipeg. Um, I knew them all. I mean, you know, when I look back now on sort of the history of the Alpine Club's sort of resurrection, which would have been in the 70s in Winnipeg, I, you know, I mean, I, I know everybody. I know everybody's names. I grew up with those people. Um, you know, I think, you know, in a way, you know, they were sort of these pioneers at that time of, of this resurgence of rock climbing in, in the Manitoba area. This is Weasel Crack. It's about uh, 50, 60 feet. It was um, myself and um, you, Spence, and somebody else first climbed it. We actually saw the weasel. Or, you know, I think we saw a weasel that was running around in the area. It's, uh, it's, we called it 5.6 once, but I think 5.7 is more appropriate. But the 5.7 is really restricted to a small piece of the crack. And uh, so, yeah, 5.7 I'd call it. And when was that? When did you...? Oh, that's a long time ago. I think that was 1972, so we're talking close to 40 years ago now, <laughs> which is a very long time. So, Barry, how much of a grade change does it make to climb it in the rain, do you think? I think there'd been a there'd been a boom of it in the late seventies, early eighties when Peter Aitchison um, first came to the area. People were happy to just go out and climb the routes, and and, and a lot of the happy right. to climb the routes they'd set up a top rope and that was something I'd never never done before. Everything had been ground up and most of the climbing, the new routing had been ground up, cleaning it as you went. More often than not, um, it would be like Thursday evening and be, we'd get a phone call and it would be Cindy and she'd be saying, can Steve come out to play? <laughs> and my wife would say, your girlfriend's on the phone. And um, I'd say, can I? And yes, I would go. <laughs> Steve was a fellow that we met through the club and him and uh, Jake, my first husband, and I did a lot of climbing together in the early years. And when I was in Ireland, I got the name of the Mad English Gardener and I think I got the same name from Cindy and Jake when I came here because I would be up hanging off something and there'd be mud flying everywhere and they'd be covered in earth and grass and, and what have you. The 
So we we wanted to get more people involved and thought that you know we had started to hear about climbing competitions, mostly on indoor walls and stuff, but we didn't have anything like that. You may recall the IMAX theater in the Portage Place, and they gave us the, uh, the two levels. There's a crosswalk uh, uh, going from the second floor to the uh, opposite side, and they allowed us to put the wall up there. And again, it was quite significantly large. And then we, we had some, a lot of fun painting it. We were just kind of splashing paint and <laughs> we put hand hole, hand prints on there and yeah, it was lots of fun. It was kind of weird pink wall, pink and purple. All the people shopping, coming along and watching and asking silly questions. And then I remember uh, Jake was climbing and there was a big finger hold, just like a pocket that just your finger would fit in. And he had a bandage on his finger for some reason and he couldn't get a good grip, so he took his teeth and he ripped off the bandage and stuck his finger in and the crowd just erupted. They were so excited and it was, it, so it was really neat having the people right there, right behind you while you were climbing. The Portage Place climbing competition wall that we created there ended up going to the Army Barracks on Kennison Boulevard at the time. And this lasted for at least a good three or four years before Vertical Adventures came around and we were able to transport some of those walls. It's just always hit and miss when you go to Squamish and you're on the coast and then you get rain, right? So we drove back into Vancouver and went to the climbing gym. And we just had so much fun and, and thought that, you know, it would be so nice if Winnipeg had one of these. And we waited a couple of years and nothing happened. And I was sort of, uh, you know, I was teaching at the time, but, you know, it was probably time to move on, find something else to do. And, and so we kept thinking, you know, if no one else is going to do it, let's do it. So we did it, and uh, it was quite successful. I did visit the gym occasionally um, while they were building it. I did a little bit of helping with it, and I was there when they were, in the end, putting holds on the wall. When we opened the gym, I really thought that it would be the climbers that would come. <laughs> well, it turned out it was more people that just, you know, had never climbed before, trying things out. We had bachelor parties, we had bachelorette parties, we had birthday parties, we had anniversaries. I mean, we did get the climbers, but we got a lot more of, of other people who just wanted to try it. Winnipeg is, uh, is gaining more and more indoor gyms, and so it's really nice to see those busy and to see young people really focused on honing their skills. Uh, but I do hope they, uh, they realize that there's a whole outdoor scene. When you first walk into Grassy, you're kind of greeted by this like cathedral of stone that just kind of all uh, encompasses you. It initially looks like nothing, just a bunch of trees, but as soon as you walk into the grove, it's, uh, it's a, like a magical clearing. Massive boulders to your left and right and behind and in front, and it kind of just feels like a playground as you enter. It, you often need that one person to, to push you that extra you know, mile or whatever to, to get outdoors. But yeah, for me, it was the natural progression. You start indoors, you work it up a little bit, see if you like it, and then, and then invest in all the gear that you need to go outdoors. It's an interesting sport. And um, obviously, the challenge of getting up something, doing something very, very difficult is part of it. But it's a lot more than that. It's um, climbing is a, it takes you away. It's a bit like meditation. When you're climbing, all your worries and fears disappear. You just have there with the moment you and the rock, your abilities, and it's it's relaxing in spite of, at the same time as it's incredibly difficult if you're doing a hard climb. It relaxes the mind, it feels good, and more people should do it and try it. 
climbing at Grassy kind of feels like in the same way as you're climbing at Vertical Adventures. It's kind of a uh, an enclosed space where everyone's kind of just climbing different problems at the same time and kind of cheering each other on. I think it's important to know the history of an area and who developed it. To have an appreciation for the space and the care they put into it and how they kind of have set the standard for how an area should be uh, cared for. I think that's really important to know as you climb. If the history of an area is filled with generous people, I feel very connected to the work they've done. There's been decades and decades of development in uh, northwestern Ontario and Manitoba, and it's taken countless hours and weekends and so much energy to make sure the boulders are scrubbed and everything's in pristine condition for uh, everyone to enjoy. I have so much appreciation for the folks that came before me.